Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Thomas, and I am a Wisconsin Certified Municipal Clerk with the City Clerk's Office. Today, the City Clerk will present election training for the August 9th Partisan Primary. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session, and it will be accessible through the same link that you are using right now. If you have any questions, please click the little speech bubble at the bottom of the screen and type them into the form. We'll be answering questions at the end of each section, plus we'll have some time at the end too. Uh, just a caution, there is a little bit of a delay, so go ahead and ask your question as soon as you have it. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we will be sure to follow up afterward. We will also attach a full list of questions and answers to the on-demand version of this presentation. You can still submit questions using the little speech bubble, even if you are not watching the webinar live. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Mary Beth. Our presenter today has been City Clerk since 2006. Thank you, Thomas. It's great to be here with all of you today. We'll start out with our goal. Our goal is for each eligible voter to be able to cast a ballot and have that ballot counted. Just a recap of our spring election this past April, we had 20% voter turnout, and that was over 34,000 votes that were cast. On election day, we had over 1,300 voters register at the polls, and we processed over 13,000 absentee ballots at the polls. There were a total of 28 absentees that were rejected based on their certificate envelopes. Something that is in the works right now that would affect all of you is that the Madison Common Council is considering a proposal that would create a separate disorderly conduct offense uh, for actions that are targeted at election officials who are working in their official capacity. And this will be before the Common Council in the beginning of August, so before the August primary takes place. It would increase the fine that would be given to somebody who uh, was convicted of disorderly conduct um, if that disorderly conduct was targeted toward an election official. So that is something you might be hearing about uh, in the coming weeks. It was just introduced, or is uh, just about to be introduced at the Common Council. We do have a lot of changes because of redistricting. So as you know, redistricting took place this past year, and we had new wards for the April spring election. However, after the city did its redistricting, the state formed its legislative districts, so its state assembly districts and state senate districts, and some of those lines crossed ward boundaries. So the city was required to create additional wards to accommodate those state legislative districts. You might be at a polling place that had one ward this past April election, and now that one ward has suddenly been split into two, and that would be because those two new wards have different state assembly representatives, and we have to report our election results by ward. So we can't have a ward that's split between assembly districts. Uh, the only way we can have wards split would be for school district boundaries, but we don't need to worry about that for this election. Uh, there are some wards that are just lakes or portions of lakes, and so you might have a ward at your polling place where 
there's been a ballot created, but you're not going to have any voters because it's just representing the portion of a lake that falls within an assembly district. We also have plenty of polling place changes this election. Uh, as you recall, in April, we were not in any facilities that are operated by the Madison Metropolitan School District. But beginning with the August primary, we will be in MMSD facilities. There are some MMSD facilities that are under construction right now, and we won't be in those for August, but perhaps we'll be allowed to hold elections in those facilities for November. So there may be more changes on the horizon. But at this point, we have 99 polling locations citywide, which is a record. We've never had so many polling locations in the past. For the partisan primary, we have enough ballots for up to 80% turnout. We don't expect to see 80% turnout. It probably will be closer to 50% turnout, but we order a lot of extra ballots for the partisan primary because we know that a lot of voters are going to need second ballots issued and perhaps even third ballots issued. Uh, so that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today in training. So far, we have issued more than 21,000 absentee ballots. The ballot instructions for this election are not as simple as they are for most elections. This is the partisan primary, which means that we have instructions to help make sure the voters' selections are going to be counted by the tabulator. And it's good to review this with every voter, not just say, are you familiar with this type of ballot? Because the instructions for the partisan primary are very specific and can be hard to remember. We only have this type of election in the fall of every even numbered year. So we're going to tell the voter to select one political party at the top of the ballot. That's in the section that says party preference section. That's the first opportunity to mark something on the ballot. And once they've selected a political party there, they would then find that party section on the ballot and then vote for individual candidates in that political party. So the way the partisan primary works is that there are four political parties that are each holding a separate election trying to determine who should be on the ballot for that party in the November election. So you could view each party section of the ballot as an individual ballot. Each ballot basically has four different elections taking place on that one sheet of paper, but each voter only gets to vote in one of those elections on the ballot. So the voter cannot vote in the Republican primary and the Libertarian primary. They have to choose one party and vote in that party's primary. Uh, it can be confusing, and the primary for each party tends to look like it's running right into the other party. There's a little stop sign saying you've reached the end of this party's primary, but the voter might not necessarily catch that when looking at the ballot. Crossover voting is what happens when a voter does not select a party at the top of the ballot, and then they cast votes in more than one political party. And in that case, the entire ballot is invalidated. Nothing on that ballot counts. So each of your voting booths is going to have a sign that reminds the voter you can only vote 
in one political party, voting in more than one political party may void your voting choices. And you'll hear voters say, but I've always voted in more than one party's primary. However, Wisconsin has run its fall primary this way since the early 1900s, and it's always confusing for voters, but these are the rules we have in place in Wisconsin. We only get to vote in one party for the partisan primary. Then come November, voters can vote for whichever parties they want, but for this election, they have to choose one party and stick with that party. So again, the instructions. The voter should select one political party at the top of the ballot, find that party section on the ballot, and then vote for individual candidates in that political party. When the voter is choosing a party at the top of the ballot, what they're doing is telling the tabulator only count votes in this political party on my ballot. Now, there is no longer any straight party ticket like we've seen in, um, or seen on the November ballot years ago. So if you select a political party, that's just saying to the tabulator, look at the section of the ballot. But if you select a party and then you don't vote for any candidates within that party, none of the candidates in that party receive any votes from your ballot. We sometimes have voters tell us that they want to change their political party or change their party preference for this election. And as you know, when voters register in Wisconsin, they do not provide us with a party affiliation. Wisconsin has what is called an open primary, which means at the voting booth, each voter gets to choose a party. And there's no way to know which voter chose which party or how any voter had voted in a past partisan primary. So the voters' decision on which political party they choose, that is something that only they will know. And once again, the ballot instructions, select one political party at the top of the ballot, find that party's section on the ballot, and then vote for individual candidates in that political party. If a voter does not select a political party at the top of the ballot, then they are losing a safety net Voting in more than one political party on that ballot then would invalidate the entire ballot. And so a crossover vote on a ballot where the voter has not selected a political party means nothing on that ballot will count. When a voter does a crossover, meaning they haven't chosen a political party, and they cast votes in more than one party's primary, we are not allowed to decide what the voter's intent was for that unmarked party preference. So if you're looking at an absentee ballot where the voter had selected candidates for the Democratic Party in all but one office, and then that one office, they selected a candidate in the Republican Party's primary. That entire ballot is, is invalidated. We can't say, oh, it looks like the voter intended to vote in this political party's primary. Uh, no, the fact that even for one office they crossed over invalidates that entire ballot, it will still be counted as a ballot, but no candidates are going to be able to get a vote counted on that ballot. So here we have an example. We have a ballot where the voter did not choose a political party, 
And then they voted for a candidate in the Republican Party. And for another office, they voted for a candidate in the Democratic Party. This is a crossover vote. And because they did not choose a political party at the top of the ballot, it invalidates all votes on the ballot. When this gets fed into the machine, the tabulator is going to say, you've crossed over and we would have to have the ballot counted with no candidates receiving any votes. If the voter skips the party preference section, so they're not choosing a party at the top of the ballot, but they vote in only one political party's primary, that's okay. Voting in only one political party means that the ballot will count. However, they need to vote for individual candidates within that party, so those candidates would then each receive a vote. So here's an example. The voter skipped the party preference section at the top of the ballot, but all of their votes are within the same political party's section of the ballot. So in this example, there's no crossover, and blueberry receives a vote, and carrot receives a vote on this ballot. When the voter selects a political party at the top of the ballot, only votes in that selected party will count, and the tabulator is going to disregard any ovals that are marked in other parties partisan primary. So here we have an example. Here the voter selected the Republican Party and then they voted for candidates in both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. When this ballot is fed into the tabulator, the tabulator is going to read this noting that only votes in the Republican Party should count because that is the oval that the voter selected in the party preference section, and the tabulator will disregard any other party's votes. In this example, the voter selected a political party, but then they did not cast a vote for any candidate within that party. Uh, so the tabulator will accept this, and will, in the results, indicate that uh, this was a ballot where a voter had selected the Republican Party. However, no candidates within that party will be given a vote. Even if there was just one candidate for an office within that party on this ballot, uh, if the voter doesn't fill in an oval for that candidate, that candidate does not receive a vote. So once again, the instructions. The voter should select one political party at the top of the ballot, find that party section on the ballot, and then vote for individual candidates in that political party. For this type of election, we do go through a lot of replacement ballots, as I had mentioned earlier. So the voter gets three tries. If the voter needs to replace the ballot they were initially given, that is their second ballot. And next to their name on the poll book, we'd make a notation second, that they had received a second ballot. There's no special notation made on the ballot itself. We're just noting in the poll book that we're keeping track that nobody gets more than three tries to mark individual ballots. If the voter does cross over and the tabulator spits that ballot back out at them and says, we can't count anything on this ballot, you have crossed over multiple parties and we don't know what to count, uh, the voter could save that ballot by selecting a political party in that party preference section and then feed that same ballot back into the tabulator to be counted. 
In that case, that's not a second ballot. They're still using their first ballot, but they were able to save that ballot by selecting a party at the top. Otherwise, if they want a fresh ballot, that fresh ballot would be their second ballot. And then if they need a replacement ballot after that, that third ballot would be their final ballot that we can issue them. And if they still are crossover voting on that third ballot, their only option to save that ballot would be to select a political party at the top. So here we have an example. We have a voter who selected a candidate in the Republican Party for fruit, the Office of Fruit, and then selected a candidate in the Democratic Party for the Office of Vegetable. That's a crossover vote, and the tabulator would return that ballot to the voter because they did not select a party preference. If that voter then decided to mark a political party in that party preference section, the tabulator would accept the ballot and count only candidates within that political party's section of the ballot. Now, when we are issuing replacement ballots to voters, the ballot that needs to be discarded would be partially torn by the voter, and then we would have the voter place that ballot in our discarded ballot envelope. That discarded ballot envelope is going to be sealed in the ballot bag on election night, and we are providing you with multiple envelopes just because we know you're likely to have many more discarded ballots for this election than you typically would see. Sometimes a voter will mark their ballot, feed it into the tabulator, and then leave so quickly that we don't even realize that they left before noting that the tabulator screen gives us a warning that they can't count the ballot due to crossover contests. So in this case, the voter is not there to receive a second ballot or to choose a party preference. Our option as election officials would be to remake that crossover ballot as a blank ballot, feed that into the tabulator to be counted, and then the original ballot marked by the voter would be placed in the envelope for ballots that have been duplicated. And we would note this on the incident log, keeping the voter's name anonymous. We don't want to know the names of the voters who had crossed over. That's still a secret ballot, even as a crossover ballot. Thomas, do we have any questions? Yep, we do. We have, Great. A, we have a good, healthy amount of questions already. Uh, the first one goes back to that announcement that we had 28 rejected absentees from mm -hmm. the spring election. And just Lori asks, is a voter notified if their absentee ballot is rejected? They are not notified that their absentee was rejected. Uh, the status on the... My Vote website, where they could look up their voting history, would indicate that the absentee was rejected, but um, they might not look up uh, their voting history on that website, so they might not even realize it. Okay. Um, Alan had noted that he'd worked at the same polling place for about a decade. Oh, and wow. then in the last two elections, he's been assigned to different places, so mm -hmm. he was... That was a little confusing, and he was wondering um, how the election officials are assigned. And I know we touched on that, that especially in this redistricting year, right. there's been a lot of shuffling people around to totally new places. Exactly. And we try to keep you close to where you live. Ideally, at each polling place, we would have election officials who live in that neighborhood. Uh, but we do have some areas where we have more election official slots to fill 
then we have uh, people in the neighborhood who have signed up to work at the polls. So there are some election officials who are driving a bit to get to their polling lo location at which they're serving on election day. Okay, we have um, questions, probably more clarifications of all, yeah. of all of what the machine does, especially with crossovers. Mm -hmm. So um, M has asked, when processing absentees, if they cross voted, do we try to feed that ballot into the machines? Uh, what do we do with it? So if there's a crossover vote, you, you can feed it into the tabulator, and the tabulator will then tell you that it can't count anything on the ballot because of the crossover vote. Um, that's a good practice to feed it into the machine because uh, it can be hard as humans to catch all the crossovers, but the machine will catch that for us and give the ballot back to us, and then we would remake that as a blank ballot. So you are going to be remaking ballots, and then often uh, in this type of election, the remade ballot is a blank ballot that has a sticker on it indicating which original ballot it is based on. It's going to have your election official initials, and you're going to indicate uh, that you remade it on your incident log, but we're not going to keep track of which voters had crossed over. All right. And Cindy is asking about that second ballot if we're rescuing it. So they've cross-voted. Mm -hmm. We go back. The machine rejects it. The voter chooses a party. Right. But let's say they never fill in that second office where they had cross-voted. Mm -hmm. Will the machine note that, or is it just going to say, hey, good, I'm glad? The, yeah, the ma <laughs> machine will take that as if the voter had just skipped a contest. Uh, so when the voter has that uh, ballot that they're trying to save by marking a political party at the top, uh, if there are any offices within that party where they had not cast a vote, they could do so at that time and then feed it into the tabulator to be counted. Uh, let me see. Elma asks, um, so the, the, let's say they have to, it takes them two ballots, right? So mm -hmm. their first one's discarded. Um, she was just double checking on how, uh, how is it destroyed and how is that then documented? So the voter is going to fold their first attempt or their second attempt, the, the ballot that's being discarded, they'll fold it and partially tear it. They shouldn't be tearing it into shreds, but you'll find that sometimes they do, and there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, but the voters should put that ballot that's being discarded in the discarded ballot envelope. Uh, we shouldn't be grabbing the ballot from the voter. We'll let the voter handle their own ballot. They still do have the right to secrecy with how they marked that original ballot, even if it can't be counted. Uh, on the poll book next to that voter's name, we would write second if that voter had been issued a second ballot, and we'd write third if the voter had been issued a third ballot. They do not get a new voter slip number they're still the same number voter that they were when they checked into the poll book, but uh, their ballot that cannot be counted is essentially thrown away in that discarded ballot envelope. Um, and if the voter, we've had some instances where the voter has torn the, <laughs> the the discarded ballot to shreds and maybe thrown it in the garbage can, we try to retrieve those pieces and put them in that discarded ballot envelope. Okay. Um, Michael's just confirming, I think we sort of answered it, but when they put a ballot in that has a cross vote on mm -hmm. it, the tabulator itself will give us a message and refuse it, yes, right? Yes, okay. that's right. And the reason we need to remake it as blank is that the tabulator simply won't accept a crossover voted ballot, right? There is an option, well, we haven't run our public test yet, but I 
think there's an option that we can say that's okay accept this anyway that option really is only to be used by voters where the voter would say that's okay accept this ballot and i know nothing will count uh, but if it's an absentee we're going to remake that crossover ballot as a blank ballot will do and janice uh this might have been during the present during before this slide showed up, but mm -hmm. she just uh, double checks. If no party is declared, but all the votes are cast in one party, it will That's be, okay. Yep, that will be counted. Yes, okay. that party preference section really is a safety net. Excellent. Okay. Yep, we have a couple people who have asked that question, just, just being safe okay. there. So. Um, Lisa's got a great suggestion. Um, would there be any way to color code a ballot so that those four different parties are easier to see and understand? Yeah, that's a good question. So the ballots are designed by the county clerk's office, and then that design gets approved by the state. And I'm not sure what the, um, what the rules would allow as far as color coding goes. Interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, this question, what happens if a voter marks two or more parties and votes in those parties sections in that party preference at the top? Right. The tabulator is then going to say that it's an overvote and won't be able to process it. So the voter's only option there would be to get a second ballot or a third ballot. Mm. Todd's got a good question. Um, when we talk about remaking a ballot as blank in a mm -hmm. crossover vote situation so that we can count the ballot, right? but we're not counting votes, right? why do we do that? And what's, well, the, what's the purpose there? Yeah. Every hour you are checking at the polls how many ballots have been processed by the tabulator and does that match the number of voters that we've checked into the poll book? So even if no candidates are going to receive a vote based on someone's ballot, we do need to get a ballot processed for each voter. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, James is going to be a poll worker for the first time mm. and is concerned about not making mistakes <laughs> yes. and asks if he will be paired with a veteran. Absolutely, yes. So. If you are new to working at the polls, thank you for signing up to do this. And your chief inspector at the polling place will make sure that you are paired with somebody who's done this before and will make sure you're set up for success. Chris has got one. Or I don't know the answer to this. I'm curious. Uh, if a voter submits an absentee ballot that is rejected, mm -hmm. can they try again in person on Election Day? They cannot. So once they have returned that absentee sealed in the envelope, their vote is considered to have been cast, even if it's a crossover and no votes on the ballot will be counted. All right. Janet is just double checking. It's just this every, it's this fall primary right. on even numbered years where we get this situation. That's yes. really it, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Part of the reason why for voters it is confusing because it doesn't it is. happen all the time. Yep, Jean makes a recommendation. Uh, an election worker may want to remind the voter to make sure their ballot was accepted. Yes, yeah, wait like, to see the screen say thank you for voting. Your ballot has been counted. And then uh, Mary just uh, asks, can, I'm not quite sure, but I'll uh, read it as is. Can we stand at the tabulator and look, this is in quotes, at the ballot before they enter the tabulator? No. The voter needs to be able to cast a secret ballot, and so we should not be hovering over anyone feeding their ballots into the machine. We should make sure that if we have an election official nearby, they are at least 10 feet away from that machine. We don't want to see how individual voters have chosen to mark their ballots. All right. So that covers all the topics. Some Great. of the, we had some repeats on questions. So if you didn't hear your name, 
Hopefully we got the subject matter, though, because yes. a couple of people had similar questions about oh, the crossovers. Great. great minds think alike. Well, now we'll go on to talk about write-in votes, because this is something that we deal with a lot in the partisan primary. So this is going to be the election where you have a write-in tally sheet for each political party on the ballot, and it feels like we are dealing with a lot of write-ins. So just a reminder on the rules for which write-ins we tally. We tally write-ins for registered write-in candidates. So these are candidates who declared that they were write-in candidates by noon the Friday before the election, and then they filed the appropriate paperwork to be a write-in candidate with either the county clerk or the Wisconsin Elections Commission. How will you know that they're a registered write-in candidate? We will pre-print their name on your write-in tally sheet. We also tally write-ins for offices that do not have enough candidates to fill the number of votes that uh, are available for that office. So just for an example, uh, the Libertarian Party has a lot of offices where there are no candidates listed on the ballot. So for the office of governor, it says vote for one, and the only option is write in. In this instance, if somebody is voting in the Libertarian Party's primary, and they do a write in for one of these offices that have no candidates listed on the ballot, all of those write ins are tallied. <coughs> we also tally all write ins for an office if a candidate listed on the ballot for that office has passed away. Uh, we have not encountered that yet since that rule one and two effect. Uh, but for the partisan primary, we're going to have to look at which party the voter has selected for uh, this ballot and then determine whether we have to tally any write-ins for that office. So tallying write-ins on election night in August takes a lot longer than typical. And we're gonna go through some examples. Now there may be some write-ins that require us to adjust the results tape. So here's an example where somebody had selected the Democratic Party in the party preference section, and then they voted within that party, but they liked a candidate on the ballot so much that they decided to write in that candidate rather than filling in the oval for that candidate. So we wouldn't be tallying this as a write-in. We would adjust the results tape to indicate that there's one additional vote for strawberry. And we would document this on the incident log. So remember, you have two copies of the results tape that would need to be adjusted. One goes to the county clerk on election night and one goes to the city clerk. And what you document on the incident log is going to prompt the board of canvassers to make sure that that official tally is updated for strawberry. Um, we also have an example here where a voter selected an oval for a candidate on the ballot and the tabulator would have, in this case, counted a vote for Apple. But then they wrote in Blueberry, who also is a candidate for that office within that party. Now, the state's rule is that if the voter goes to the effort to write in a candidate's name, that write-in takes precedence over an oval marked for a different candidate. So this isn't considered an overvote. This actually is a case where we need to adjust the results tape 
Apple receives one less vote than the tabulator had thought. And because the voter had gone to the effort to write in Blueberry, who is a candidate on the ballot for that office, the results tape is adjusted to indicate there's one additional vote for Blueberry. And we would also document this on the incident log. Here we have another example where the voter picked a party, stayed within that party, filled in an oval for a candidate on the ballot, but then they did a write-in for that same office. So the rule is that the write-in takes precedent and Apple would receive one less vote. However, in our fictional uh, example here, Peach is not a registered writing candidate. Peach is not a candidate on the ballot. And so Peach doesn't qualify to be tallied on the write-in tally sheet. However, uh, Apple gets one vote subtracted, and we would document on the incident log that uh, this took place, and uh, we would not be counting a vote for Peach unless Peach had been a registered writing candidate. Now we also have something that the state has called drag over write-in votes. And this would be a case where the voter knows that they have to pick a party and stay within that party, but then they try to, um, try to trick the system by writing in a candidate for the party that they did not select. So they're trying to be smart about um, getting the tabulator to accept a, what would appear to be a crossover. However, this voter in this example has chosen the Democratic Party. They are voting for who the Democratic Party should put on the ballot in November. And they have written in Apple which is a candidate for the Office of Fruit in the Republican Party. Uh, Apple is not a writing candidate for the Democratic Party. Apple is not a Democratic Party candidate. So in this instance, we would just document this on the incident log. You are not allowed to drag over a candidate from one political party to the next. And Apple does not get any votes on uh, on the write in tally sheet or on the results tape in this instance. You can't drag over a candidate from one party to another. So you will have separate write in tally sheets for each political party, two copies of each. One copy then goes to the city, one goes to the county at the end of the night. We never tally write-ins or even begin separating ballots for the write-in tally until after the polls have closed and we've run the results tapes. We do not want to be handling the ballots while voting is going on. Those ballots stay in the tabulator cart in that ballot box until the results have been run. So the state has put together four principles for determining the eligibility of write-in votes. Uh, this is just another way of presenting the same information we've gone through. You may find it helpful. Uh, we're going over the same material in a few different ways just because we each think a little differently and maybe one of these uh, strategies will resonate with you. So for the four principles, the first principle is that if the number of ballot candidates for a given office is equal to or greater than the number of seats to be filled, so on this ballot we have vote for one in each of the um, offices for each party because each party can only put one candidate on the November ballot for each office. So in that case only votes for registered writing candidates are eligible for counting if there is already a candidate 
listed on the ballot for that office. Principle two for determining the eligibility of write-in votes is that if there are fewer ballot candidates for a given office than the number of seats to be filled, all write-in votes are eligible for counting. So if the political party in which that voter is casting their ballot does not have a candidate for a given office on that ballot, all write-ins for that office are eligible for counting. The third principle for determining the eligibility of write-in votes is that if there are any candidates for a given office and one or more has passed away, then all write-in votes are eligible for counting in that office, in that political party. And then the fourth principle for determining the eligibility of write-in votes is that if there are enough write-in votes to fill the number of seats up for election, regardless of the eligibility of the write-in votes, votes for ballot candidates may not be considered. So this probably sounds a little confusing because we do not have offices on the ballot this election where it says vote for two or vote for three, like we sometimes do for uh, school district elections. For the election officials who have worked in wards that have the Wanakee School District, you have encountered this several times in recent years where on the ballot it said vote for two candidates and there was only one candidate printed on the ballot then in that case we counted all the write-ins for that office. Uh, but for this election, each office allows the voter to vote for one candidate. If the voter fills in the oval for a candidate and does a write-in, only that write-in qualifies for being counted and the oval that the voter may have filled in for a candidate on the ballot cannot be counted. And that's where we would end up, re end up making some changes on the results tape. Here are the write and vote eligibility questions uh, provided to us from the state. And they really go hand in hand with those criteria we just went through. So the first question is how many votes is a voter entitled to cast in this contest? In this partisan primary, the voter may cast one vote in each contest and only within one political party. The second question is, are all write-in votes eligible for counting or only votes cast for registered writing candidates? So if there is a candidate listed on the ballot, then we're only looking at votes cast for registered writing candidates unless we run into a situation where a candidate on the ballot has passed away. Uh, the third question is, is a write-in vote registered? And we can check on that by looking at the write-in tally sheet itself. The names of any registered writing candidates will be pre-printed on that write-in tally sheet. And then the fourth question is, are there enough write-in votes to fill the seats up for this election? So if the voter writes in a candidate for a seat on the ballot within the political party they've chosen, that means they cannot also vote for a candidate pre-printed on the ballot for that office. Any questions, Thomas? I know yep. this is very complicated. It is, it is. So uh, some of this goes back to uh, uh, some of our questions about um, preprint or, sorry. Um, yeah, let me just read them. Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> so Kelly asks, does um, tallying write-ins only happen after the polls close? And the answer is yes. yes. And how do we know they did a write-in if they didn't fill in the write-in oval? which I noticed on our examples. Right, yeah. yes. You, you may find that the voter did not complete the write-in oval, 
And that doesn't disqualify that right in the fact that the voter wrote in a name on that line means that uh, you're looking at the write-in vote. So what we're doing is we are actually going through all of the ballots to check the write-ins. Uh, Mary has a question about absentees, going mm -hmm. back to the previous section. If somebody votes absentee, um, is there something in the poll books that indicates that just in case they were to come in in person as well? You won't find that the poll books have all of the absentee information pre-printed. So it's going to indicate that somebody had been issued an absentee ballot. If the voter had been issued an absentee at the time that we print the poll book, which is a couple weeks before the election. So what you're going to do on election morning is take your absentee ballot log from your black absentee binder and highlight the names of every voter who had been issued an absentee on the poll book. And then if that voter shows up at the polls and you see that they're highlighted, you would ask that voter, did you return your absentee ballot? Right. Dan points out with uh, crossover votes that mm -hmm. if they're on their third and final ballot, their third try, right. the express vote can be a useful tool. It can, because the express vote will not allow you to cross over vote. It forces you to choose a party and then only lets you vote within that party. Yep, Cindy asked a question again about uh, absentee ballots. Uh, do we keep the rejected absentee ballots separate uh, since the voter is counted in the books but not in the tabulator? Well, the voter is going to have a ballot counted by the tabulator, but it might not have any votes on it. So if an absentee voter does a crossover vote, you're going to have to remake that absentee ballot as a blank ballot. Uh, Patrick just notes, uh, uh, can we uh, ask a question? I think it's more a, sort of an observation. Mm -hmm. Uh, can we expect a higher portion of rejected ballots, especially with absentees? Yes, yes, okay. you can, unfortunately. Yep. And uh, Carl asks, for write-ins, the mm -hmm. names, how complete and correct do those names have to be? So as election officials, you will have to determine voter intent. It could be that the voter misspelled the name of the registered writing candidate, but uh, as election officials, you, f you can figure out that that's the candidate that they intended to cast a vote for. And so that's gonna be your call as election officials working together to determine the voter's intent. And we are caught up for now. Okay, so I have just a few reminders of things that have changed over the past couple of years. I know we do have some election officials who are coming back after being gone during the beginning of the pandemic. So just a reminder that residency now takes 28 days to establish. So voters who moved after Tuesday, July 12th should vote at the polling place for their previous address. And as far as voter ID goes, Wisconsin driver license, Wisconsin ID card, military ID, and U.S. passport are all acceptable forms of voter ID if they have expired after November 3rd of 2020, which is the date of the last November election. The address on the ID is not relevant for proving your identity and the ID does not need to meet the federal real ID criteria. So it doesn't matter if there's a star in the corner of that driver license. Uh, if the license does not comply with the federal real ID criteria, it still meets our needs for proving your identity as a voter ID. For UW-Madison students, the WIS card does not meet voter ID requirements. The student can get a free voter identification card from UW-Madison. Now, if that student is an in-state student and they have a Wisconsin driver license or Wisconsin ID, that could be used as their voter ID. Uh, 
a UW-Madison student who is showing a voter identification card that is expired is okay as long as they also present proof of current enrollment. But if a UW-Madison student is showing an unexpired voter identification card from the UW, they do not need to show us proof of current enrollment. And then on election morning, you will find absentee carrier envelopes locked in the tabulator bin. You want to make sure you remove all of those absentee carrier envelopes before the polls open, and then you'll begin processing those uh, as soon as you get through your initial line of voters on election morning. If a voter is delivering an absentee envelope to the polling place, they may only deliver their own absentee per court ruling. Uh, if there are any accommodation requests, uh, you'll have to call the clerk's office on a case-by-case -case basis for those, and we will be running those by the city attorney. So if somebody is not able to deliver their own absentee to the polls because of a disability, that would require a call to the clerk's office and then we will get in touch with the city attorney. And then once again, because we can't say it enough, the ballot instructions for this election are to select one political party at the top of the ballot, find that party section on the ballot, and then vote for individual candidates in that political party. Thomas, do we have any other questions? Yep, we do have a few. Um, Kathy asks, does the machine sort out the write-in ballots for us? The machine does not sort out the write-in right. ballots. That's, I was afraid that was the answer. Yes. Um, Glenda, I, th I think what her question is is that somebody's going to put their ballot into the machine that's going to have a crossover vote, mm -hmm. and they're going to be confused and not understand why. And right. then she asks, are we looking at people's ballots that are supposed to be private? We will only look at the voter's ballot if the voter invites us to do so. So no grabbing the voter's ballot to say, let me see what the issue is here. We will know from the, the information on the tabulator screen that there is a crossover vote. So from that, we would be able to tell the voter it looks like you must have voted in more than one political party. This is the type of election where each voter is limited to one political party of their choice. And so you'll want to select a party at the top of the ballot and then cast votes for candidates within that party. And we had somebody noted that for them on their computer, the uh, webinar stopped early. So I would just say, if anybody's in that situation, come back and uh, watch it right after this, once sure. it's archived. Yeah. Uh, Jean asks for about identification. I have had a voter register, and they showed an envelope from a rental office, and their address or name is on it. Um, and she noted, please open that envelope, because it might just be an advertisement. So, right, an envelope yeah. is not enough for, yeah. and I think she's thinking of um, proof of address for voter registration. All right, let's see. I think, let me just make a quick sweep here just to make sure. And somebody who asked, can you talk more about how write in ballots are tallied? I'm not quite sure. How we do that we are at 11:58. oh so. <laughs> yeah so um your your chief inspector will help you with the write and tally and uh you'll be working with multiple election officials on that so you're not going to be on your own trying to tally the write-ins but as you're tallying write-ins if you run into any questions at all just feel free to call the clerk's office and we can help you figure out uh, what it is that you're looking at and let me see. Um, Todd just wonders, when is work done? Um, how long should I plan on staying if he's, sounds like he's scheduled for the ending shift. Right. Yeah. Work is done once the tally is complete, so all the write-ins have been tallied, and everything is packed away. So you'll be working as a team to close the polls, and you'll be doing a lot of double and triple checking of numbers at the end of the night, 
filling in the blanks on the inspector statement and signing the inspector statement. There will be official signing and sealing the ballot bags, uh, signing the absentee um, envelope that is used to transport the used certificate envelopes back to the clerk's office. Uh, so you're going to be waiting for the chief inspector to say everything's complete before you head out. Now, that might take an hour. It might take a little longer, just depending on how many write-ins you have and uh, how big your polling place is, how many ballots were cast at that polling location. All right. I'm just going to take, uh, let's see, two more questions here, and okay. then I'm going to suggest everybody... Remember that the answers to all of these questions will be posted um, at this link yes. with, with the uh, training itself. Uh, Dennis just asks, if a person uh, is at the polling place, but they're in their car, and they're mm -hmm. just informing us that they have an absentee ballot to deliver, mm -hmm. how does that work? Does it work? So. It does work. They would hand that to the election officials, but you might have somebody... Uh, trying to hand you more than one absentee and you would have to inform them that we are only allowed to return our own absentee ballot so whoever else's absentees they have in hand would need to be returned by those voters and uh, final question for now mm -hmm. Isabella is wondering how do you suggest individuals go about voting if our work assignment is not our polling place in that case, you could either vote absentee by mail or vote at an in-person absentee site or make arrangements with your chief inspector to be able to leave the polling place on election day to go to your own polling location to vote. All right. That seems to be it for us today. And... My laptop is doing odd, odd things. So, um, so just to wrap up, um, it looks like we've covered actually all of the questions. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we finish up? Here? I just hope everybody has a wonderful election day. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you for attending. If you have additional questions, please contact the clerk's office. You can send an email message to Madison Votes, M A D I S O N V O T E S, at cityofmadison.com. Remember to check the webinar box on your election day timesheet so that we will pay you for this training. And your chief inspector will have an oath of office for you to sign on election day. So thank you again for joining us, and we will see you then. Thank you.